Shout out to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Hey guys, Spirit of the Lie here. In this video, we're going to take a look at my favorite of the recent DLC sieves. I've talked a fair amount about their mechanics in depth through several deep dive videos, but this time we're going to put it all together and take a big picture look at the polls. They're classified as a cavalry civilization, and as we'll see, they're very well suited for spamming knights, cavalier, or hazard. But they also have a very solid infantry unique unit as well, on top of completely viable archers, giving them a lot of options to consider. By recent online win rates, they're worse than about two-thirds of civilizations in 1v1 open maps, but really hit their stride in closed maps, where they're actually top three. We'll talk about the reasons for that, as well as how to get the most out of their very unusual bonuses and techs. Let's check them out. To start with their team bonus, the scout line for Poles and their allies receive a hidden and unblockable plus one attack against archers. This refers to the entire archer class, including the crossbow line, skirmishers, cavalry archers, and hand cannoneers. There's lots of archer and cavalry archer unique units as well, and all of them take the extra damage. To get a rough sense of it, in Feudal Age that's often going to give you 20% more attack, which fits nicely in any team game where scouts and archers are an incredibly common pairing. It's even factored into the Winged Hazard's trample damage, though in that case it's one extra damage every three attacks. Next, let's move on and take a look at their civilization specific bonuses. The first is that Polish villagers recover HP over time at an increasing rate throughout the game. In Dark Age, it's not incredibly impressive at just 5 HP per minute, but in Imperial Age, it maxes out at the same speed as an unupgraded Berserk. The earliest you'll notice this in action is when luring a boar, where within a couple of minutes, your villagers will all be back to full health. I suspect it's also intended to offset the added potential risk from using a full arc. Poles are uniquely incentivized to place their starting farms away from their town center, making them more exposed. This bonus probably won't save a villager in a raid, but between raids allows them to recover and be ready for the next one. I've also seen this come in handy when tower rushing, where you can be a bit more aggressive in villager fights. Their next bonus is the full arc, which replaces their mill. It's more expensive and takes longer to build, but actually counts as both a house and a mill together. The big advantage it has though is any farms built immediately around it automatically drop off 10% of their food when constructed. That's affected by mill upgrades, giving a little extra incentive to get your farming upgrades early. Even without farming upgrades though, you get an instant 17 and a half food for each farm built, which can add up pretty quickly. Keep in mind the range is pretty unforgiving though, and you need to either have the farm right up against the full work or with just a one tile gap in order to get the effect. That means no matter how you shuffle them around, the maximum number of farms per full work is always 8. The advantage of the 10% instant drop off is not only that you're getting your food income front loaded, but your average collection rate also goes up as well. In fact, it ends up being comparable to the Slavs farming bonus, assuming you aren't placing farms around town centers. That said, I'd consider it a personal choice whether you place your early farms around your starting town center for the extra protection or a full work for the better food income. Having your early farming economy exposed can definitely backfire if you're not walled, which gives it a fun risk versus reward trade-off. And if you're under a lot of pressure early on, I think it's justifiable to put the farms around your starting town center instead. By the late game though, this just turns into an all-around boost to your general farming efficiency. Their last bonus is that their stone miners generate one gold for every two stone they mine. This is my favorite of their bonuses because of how many different ways you can use it. The most obvious is it lets you put your regular gold miners plus a few extra onto stone to build an early castle while not completely sacrificing your gold income. You could then either use your early castle defensively or aggressively to put pressure on your opponent depending on how things play out. Alternately, if you're tower rushing or making defensive towers, this obviously helps because the whole time you're on stone, you're indirectly working toward the gold cost for castle age on the side. To dig even a bit deeper, like the Saracens, you can also mine stone instead of gold to sell at the market. In fact, theoretically, that's a faster way of generating gold than actually mining gold directly, about a third faster with starting market prices. 
In fact, on paper, mining stone over gold is better as long as the sell price is above 55, which would take selling 1900 stone to drop below. Of course, this has the extra hassle of needing a market and to do the action of selling, plus you may not like the idea of permanently losing stone for castles or giving your opponent cheap stone prices, so there's a few things to consider. Another side effect of the bonus is that with typical starting resources, you end up with about 1600 more gold available from natural sources around your town center, meaning you have access to 13% more gold from the map than most civilizations. Any way you look at it, it's a really solid bonus, commonly used to get an early castle, but is beneficial even if you don't care at all about stone and only want gold. Also, as a side note, if you want to speed up the effect, it's enhanced with the stone mining techs and not gold mining, as it's just a 1 to 2 ratio. So, speeding up how quickly you mine stone brings up the gold trickle to match. So that's the poll's bonuses. Depending on your point of view, you could say they have either 2 or 3 economic bonuses, though notice they all seem to take a while to kick in. Early on, the villager recovery bonus is at its weakest, the full work has no benefit until you build farms, and mining gold or stone typically isn't done until late dark or even early feudal age. By the time you're booming on multiple town centers though, poles arguably have one of the strongest economies in the game. With their bonuses covered, now let's switch to the castle and check out their unique unit. The best I can tell, it's pronounced the Obuch, with a small exhale at the end of the word. Taking a look at their stats, they have unusually high armor and HP for an infantry unit, being noticeably more tanky than the champion line. They're pretty comparable in cost as well, and are even a bit cheaper to upgrade when everything's factored in. It trains fairly quickly, though its training speed has been nerfed from 9 to 12 seconds since release, making it a fairly easy unit to mass, especially considering how easy it is to have more than one early castle as poles. The most unusual aspect of the unit though is its unique ability to remove enemy armor. The way it works is each attack removes one melee and pierce armor from their target until it falls to zero. That means even though the obu has a bit lower attack than the swordsman line, removing armor has the effect of essentially increasing its damage after each hit on the same target over time. Likewise, it means other support units, like archers or skirmishers, will also be doing additional damage because of the removed pierce armor. Given skirmishers' low base attack, they can actually benefit a lot from this, and to cherry pick one example, elite skirmishers usually do just one damage to paladins when all upgrades are in, but after being tenderized with three hits from an obu, paladins take triple the usual damage from Polish elite skirmishers, which is actually the same damage that they normally take from arbalesters. Of course, the effect is a bit situational, since it doesn't help against units that have no armor to begin with, or units with low HP that go down after just a couple of attacks. Even without the armor shredding ability though, it would still be a solid infantry unit for a very reasonable price. Also, while it doesn't remove armor from buildings, Obu have quite a bit of bonus damage against them, meaning unlike archers and cavalry, even a medium sized group of Obu can be a significant threat to gates, house walls, and even production buildings. As infantry, of course their biggest weakness is generally against ranged units. Hand cannoneers, for example, are a very hard counter, though against some archers they actually hold up surprisingly well. Obu have unusually high pierce armor, letting them take around twice as many shots from arbalesters in Imperial Age than champions, though I'd still consider arbalesters here a soft counter. They're also weak to any of the anti-infantry specialists, and they can be beaten with raw power with units like Teutonic Knights, Elephants, or Boyars. In contrast, their best matchups are against trash units, where they perform better against halberdiers, hussars, and skirmishers than even the champion, and can actually handle knights cost-effectively as well. So that's their unique unit, and now let's take a look at their unique techs, both of which tie in with poles as a cavalry civilization. The first reduces the gold cost of knights and cavaliers by 60%. Now initially that may sound overpowered, but there's a couple of things to keep in mind. It costs 500 food and 300 gold, so you need to make 18 discounted units to recoup just the initial resource cost of the tech. Getting it too early can stall your knight production and set you behind if you're not careful, and this is on top of needing to build a castle first. It can even hold back your imperial age time, costing roughly half the imperial age cost, so sometimes it doesn't even make sense to grab until after you've already clicked up. It's also offset by Pole's missing paladin and the final cavalry armor upgrade, so against archers especially, your cavaliers might struggle more than you'd expect. Long term though, at least in melee, Polish Cavalier are giving a lot of cost efficiency, beating fully upgraded Paladins for example, with equal total resources. In 1v1s especially, this tech can be a game changer. 
For a simple illustration, if a typical player mines all 12,000 gold around their starting town and spends 4,000 of it on upgrades and getting to Imperial, that leaves enough left over optimistically for 107 Paladins without relying on relics and the market. On the other hand, Poles, keeping in mind that their stone gives them more total gold to play with, using a similar calculation, they could make 320 Cavalier. Factoring in not needing the Paladin upgrade also lets them pay for another 25 Cavalier as well. Regardless of how cheap they are though, eventually you can still run out of gold though, and that's where their second unique tech comes in. It's even more expensive at 750 food and 550 gold, but gives their light cavalry line trample damage. There's all sorts of variations of trample damage in the game depending on the unit, but in this case it works out to dealing a third of their damage during each attack to all adjacent units after accounting for armor. This can help quite a bit in very dense melee fighting, though they still lose to halberdiers and the usual cavalry counters. At the same time, considering they lack the final armor upgrade, in many situations they can actually be worse than generic hazards. For example, against Arbalesters, they take 30% fewer arrows than regular fully upgraded Hazar, and are likewise damaged more by town centers and castles. Of course, if you can get a good surround on a bunched up group of archers, Poles can end up looking quite good, and remember they even have plus one attack from their team bonus, though the difficulty is in getting them close enough. Even with this tech, it feels like Poles are getting more of a trade-off than a strict upgrade, performing better in melee, but worse against ranged units than many other Hazar civilizations. So that's the Poles' unique unit and techs. Obviously, you're pushed quite a bit toward cavalry, but with an infantry unique unit thrown in for some variety. To get a larger sense of their possible army compositions and strengths, let's take a look now at their tech tree, starting with the archers. Initially, they open strong, with every tech available until Imperial Age, and even after that, their arbalesters are only missing ring archer armor. Of course, they don't have a direct bonus, as they're not meant to be archer specialists, but their archers are certainly viable, especially if you have another strong cavalry player on your team. Going archer heavy isn't necessarily the standard way to play poles in general, but I'd say it's still a B for archers, and is better than expected. Next up for the infantry, the big thing that jumps out right away is they're missing halberdier. Instantly, that makes cavalry civilizations in the late game more difficult to deal with. On the other hand, they have the Obu, which is all around quite solid, especially when paired with archers or even skirmishers. In Imperial Age, Obu actually performed better against paladins than Polish pikemen, so while I wouldn't claim it's a total replacement for Halberdier, it can at least offset that missing unit to some degree. I think it's enough to bring them to an A-, minus, as their infantry is overall quite solid. Moving on to cavalry, right away you can see a lot is crossed out, including paladin and the last armor upgrade. What saves them though are their bonuses and unique techs. The instant food from the full work is great for scouts, and even more so it helps with knight production and a late game hazard spam. Of course, adding to that you have the unique tech discount on your knight line's gold cost, trample damage and a bit more attack on your winged hazards, as well as even a small bonus against archers that's easy to forget. I'd say it's an A- for cavalry. There's a lot to like, but missing Paladin and the final armor upgrade makes them a little less impressive than some other cavalry sieves, especially when it comes to raiding. Switching now to their Siege, they're only missing Siege Onager and Heavy Scorpion. The Bombard Cannon is a nice option to have, along with Siege Ram, to give something anti-building with a bit more mobility than a trebuchet. I'd say it's a solid B for Siege, where it's nothing amazing, but you rarely feel you're missing something important. Moving on to the Navy, unfortunately all of their bonuses swing and miss on water maps. You could argue the full arc lets them boom a bit more, and they have an easier time making a castle on the coast to protect their docks thanks to their stone bonus. Even that argument seems like a stretch, and they're also missing a lot of techs in the late game as well. I'd say it's an underwhelming C for the early game, with Galleon's Embracer bringing them up to a B- late game for a combined C plus on water. Taking a quick look at the monks, I'm not sure why it is, but for some reason despite nothing particularly amazing about their monks, I always seem to remember to make a monastery and grab relics as poles. Maybe it's their red flag and winged hazards tricking my subconscious into thinking I'm playing Lithuanians. Either way, making a few monks often fits nicely into the poles army, and the most important monk techs are present, albeit without any specific bonuses. I'd say it's decent enough for a B at their monastery. Next up for their defenses, they have a very open university with self-healing villagers and a bonus that encourages going on stone early. My main uneasiness about their defenses is instead they're missing counter units. They don't have hand cannoneer, halberdier, and their elite skirmishers are missing the last armor upgrade. So in the late game especially, it can be challenging to take cost effective fights when you're on the back foot. I'm going to take a pretty holistic approach to defenses this time around, and I think that drops them down to a B, even though the university itself has some great options, especially for towers. 
And finally, for their trash units, meaning Spearman, Skirmisher, and Light Cavalry lines, as mentioned, they don't have Halberdier and their Elite Skirmishers aren't fully upgraded. Even the Winged Hazars lack the final armor upgrade, which makes them feel like more of a trade-off than a strict upgrade over the regular Hazar. I'm usually not overexcited at the idea of a trash war as poles, so I'll say it's a B-. Keep in mind though, with discounted Cavalier and extra gold from your stone mines, poles are in a good position to have their gold outlast their opponents, delaying or potentially avoiding the trash war stage of the game. So to finish with some general thoughts, personally I love playing poles, but admit they can be a little tricky. If you play conventionally, placing early farms around your town center instead of the full work, putting villagers on gold instead of stone, and going for cavalry without picking up their unique techs, you can end up missing most of what the Civ is offering. They're missing a lot of passive economic and military bonuses besides self-healing villagers, which makes them harder to pick up than civilizations like Franks or Slavs, for example. In my experience and what I've seen from other players, there's really three broad game plans that work well as poles. One way is to play them as an archer civilization, which eventually leads to an arbalester and siege ram combination. Second, you can play them as a pure cavalry sieve, going from scouts into knights with a defensive castle to pick up their knight discount so you can spam cavalier and eventually wing to czar. The third option is to either open with scouts or archers or even fast castle, and then transition into an early forward castle and use the obu as the backbone of your army. Given their quick creation and solid bonus damage against buildings, this is a strategy that seems to work particularly well on Arena. The fact they can be played as essentially an archer, cavalry, or infantry civilization is something I really like about the Civ. Though, of course, the best thing about the poles is their aesthetically pleasing, perfectly square farms. But speaking of squares, shout out to this video's sponsor, Squarespace. If you're an entrepreneur, blogger, or someone looking to organize an online community, but have no idea how to make a website from scratch, Squarespace has great tools to help you out and simplify the process. Within minutes, I was able to create a professional looking website for my future landscaping company, Spirit of the Lawn, using one of their templates and then customized it from there. Squarespace also have great third-party extensions to handle things like bookkeeping, taxes, and shipping to accommodate your specific needs. You just pick a template and domain name and you're good to go. The best part is if you use my code, you get two free weeks to try it out. And if you like it, you get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. So hopefully this video gave you a few ideas to try with polls and was a helpful overview of some of the earlier deep dives. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.